Hey, if you have your Bibles, we're, I'm going to be in Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, and then I'll be in Matthew 22. Luke chapter 10, and then Matthew chapter 22. Uh, if you're hanging out with us for the first time, uh, we were, you, you, you uh, kind of caught us right in the middle of a sermon series we kicked off in January called Practical Christianity. And so we're just going back to the Bible and kind of, kind of redefining, or, or re- let me say this way, simplifying what it means to be a Christian and what makes us different, how do we live our life uh, set apart, and how do, we, how do we make an impact for Christ. And so uh, if you've missed any of the last two or three weeks, I would encourage you to go on to our YouTube channel or download our app, and you can get all the messages there uh, if it would be uh, in your interest. I think it would be a blessing to you. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 says this, starting at verse number 25. Then an expert in the law stood up to test him, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? For what is written in the law? And he asked him, How do you read it? Or how do you interpret it? He answered, Love the Lord. This is Jesus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all of your mind. And also love your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, he told him, do this and you will live. Be, be wanting, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and just who is my neighbor? Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers and they stripped him, they beat him up and they fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. For in the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, he too passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, the Bible says he had compassion upon him. For he went over to him, and he bandaged his wounds. He poured oil and wine on his wounds, and then he put it on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him there. For the next day he took out some money, gave it to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. For which of these three do you think provide, pr- proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he said. And then Jesus said, yes, go and do the same. Matthew 22 says this, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, teacher, what is the greatest commandment uh, in the law? For Jesus replied, to to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, for all the law and the prophets hang or hinge on these two commandments. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for your word. God, it does not need any help from me. It can preach all by itself. And so, Father, we simply illuminate your word today, divide as you see fit, and place it into the lives of people where they're living. And God, our prayer is this, that we would not leave the same way we came, but God, we would be, we would be encouraged, we would be challenged, we would be pushed out of the realm of sa- safety, and God, we would be pushed into helping and loving people. God, we're thankful for, for the church and the community that we have and the people that we're reaching. Thankful, God, that you chose us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, and everybody says amen and amen. Hey, if you're taking notes, I've tagged the title, Love Your Neighbor. Love Your Neighbor. Simply put, if we narrow down our Christian faith to one simple thing, it's about one man who selflessly gave everything for us. One man who gave selflessly, he gave, he gave everything for us. He, he, he came and he served, he came and provided, uh, he came and, and he lived and he came and he died. Like the, the whole message of the Christian faith is about one man who knew no sin, but became sin. And somehow, some way uh, in our lives today, I think we've kind of we've watered down that message, we've kind of got away from that message Uh, I think sometimes we come to the contemporary church believing that we are here to get something from the church instead of coming to add something to the church. I think the contemporary form of worship is coming to receive and never coming to give. I think the modern church would be to tell you just to come and and sit and, and just receive, but you don't have to come and get a part and do. And that's the opposite of what Jesus taught. That's the opposite of what I believe the Bible teaches. Simply put, if you've, been sa- if, if, if you've been saved, then go find people that need saved. Like, found people, find people. 
the only way that you reach lost, broken people are through lost, broken people. And I don't care how well put together you think you are, at one point or another, you were somebody else's prayer life. Like you kept somebody up late at night praying for you because you weren't always as good as you were today. I wasn't always as good as I am today. I kept my mom up many nights praying for me, believing for me. And so I think sometimes the danger is we think we're better than we actually are, and we almost have this idea that we, we actually deserve the grace of God. No, none of us deserve the grace of God. None of us, n- none of us deserve heaven. None of, n- none of us deserve salvation had it not been for Jesus Christ and his blood. And so if we truly go back to the basics or the basic of, a basis of Christianity, I think we would fully understand that when we, when we are operating in our full capacity of a Christian, we should be coming to church to, 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 not, to not receive, but we should be coming to church to allow us to bring something out of you back to the hands of God. Like God wants to do, God wants to do something through you today. He wants to get something to you so he can in turn do something through you. Like if you're a Christian, here's where I want to go today, then who is it that you are helping? If you are a Christian, then who is it you are helping? I guess you could say it this way. Who are you close to that is far away from God? Because the basis of Christianity, the basics of our faith is not, ju- ju- not, not just that you and I could be saved. It's not just that you and I could have community. It's not just that you and I could be into a room and celebrate the, the, the gift that Ryan is to our church and you seeing him use his gift and be excited. But th- that's awesome and that's wonderful and that's one aspect. But, but then there's also a different side of the coin today. Who's on the outside wishing they were on the inside? So my question is not how much Bible do you know? Not, not, I'm not asking how, how, how radical you are in your worship or how much money you give to the church or how many Sundays you serve. I, I think all those are great and all those are wonderful, but let's boil it down to Christianity 101. Who is it in your life that you're helping? There should never be a season of our Christian faith that we don't have somebody in our life that we're trying to get to the feet of Jesus. Like, I want to be surrounded by like-minded people, and we, pro- we preached about it last week about friends, but, but we also have to have this missional mindset awareness that, okay, I'm on my way to heaven. Who is in my circle that is outside of the will of God, that I'm not there just to be their friend, but I'm there to be their tour guide back to the house of God, to be their tour guide to the feet, to tour guide to the feet of God? Like, who is it in your life that you're helping? Like, who is it that is far from God that that calls you for guidance. Like, they, they don't call you because, like, no, they, they call you because you have insight. They call you because they obviously are aware that you come to church and you have, a, you have a biblical understanding. Like, who is it? Who is it in your life that is, that, that, that is far from God but is actually living life close to you? I think if we would answer that question, like, who is it that, I, that I'm helping? Who is it that I'm, I'm loving? Who is it that I am investing my time in? Who is it that I am pouring my life into? Who is it that is getting the best of me? Who is it that I am, that I am praying for? Who is it that I am believing for? Who is it in my life? Who is it in your life that you're trying to get to the feet of Jesus? Could be a coworker. Could be a spouse. Could be a child, could be a boss. Teachers could be a student. Who is it? And here's what I I want to tell you. Lost people don't wear a sign, I'm lost, around their neck. Like, they're not just, they don't just walk around and like, Jesus puts a light from heaven. Hey, this person doesn't know Christ. Like, no, no, that's why we need to build relationships with people. Like, that's why we need to be in people's life. Like, it don't take you long if you're on a, uh, your, your child's soccer team sideline and a ref makes a bad call. It don't take you long to figure out who knows Christ and who doesn't. <laughs> and then sometimes if you're driving down and somebody cuts you off, it, it don't take you long to realize by their reaction who, 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 who knew, who, you know, who's saved, who's not. Until you see the arrows on the back of the car and say, yeah, there's still a work, on, work in progress. 
But I, what I want to tell you is, like, when you, are, when you are far from God, people that are far from God and lost, like, the only way that you really get to who they are is by building a bridge or building a relationship to that person. And a relationship that we want to try to reach the lost is not by you getting on a soapbox or preaching a sermon and pointing down to them. Like, we need to establish common ground to people. And although we may not agree with their lifestyle, we may not, we, we may not agree with their decision making, we may not agree with their parenting uh, outlook, we may not agree with how they live their life, it does not give you or I the right to stand up on a soapbox and point our finger down at them, but yet if we would learn to build common ground with people and let people know that we love them unconditionally and there's a better way, there's a better way to do it, there's a better outlook and we've got to be willing to, 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 to have common ground with one another. If you can't find common ground, build it. I don't know how far you got to go down to you find something that you agree on, but when you get there, start there as the foundation and build common ground. Like I believe we're here as the church of, of God to be the answer. Like we are, the, we are Christian people that have been called to make a difference. We have been not only called as a church, but we have been called individually to reach families and to reach friends and to change our city and to, and to change our workplace and to impact our world and to impact our region. And I don't know if you know it, but we've, given this, we've been given this huge opportunity right here in our city, right there in your workplace. You've been praying for God to give you a new job. He ain't going to give you a new job because you're in the mission field called your workplace. And if you get that place saved, then he might open up another door for you to go to another workplace. Well, I'm the only Christian in my workplace. Exactly. Could it be that God knows exactly where you are and why he put you there? Like, why would you want to work with all bunch of saved people? I do, and it gets boring once in a while. <laughs> Get me around some heathen people. Like, make it interesting. So could it be that you are in that job environment, in that construction zone, in that classroom full of a bunch of crazy kids? Could it be that you're there on purpose? There to make a difference? Because I think if, you're, if we all would just scale back, we all are living in this great land of opportunity. Like we are here as God's church, not just to be a solution, but to offer the solution. We're not just called to give a answer, we're called to give the answer. We're not here to just to give a way, we're here to point them to the way. And so when you understand that we're not called just to be a part of the solution, but we actually have the entire answer for all of life's worries, all of life's needs, all of life's hang-ups. Like the thing that we desire most in our world today is feeling like we connect with people. That's why we're so addicted to social media. Over 8 billion people on the planet today. And all we want to do is make sure people like us and people follow us and we're friends with people. You know what they're after? They're after community. That's why the Bible says when, they, when the early church was formed, they gathered together in one place and they shared all that they had. Could it be that the Bible is teaching at such an early age of just what it means to have community with people? Like, I believe if the church was healthy and functioning the way it should be functioning, we would not need social media influence. We would have influence within the body of Christ. Like, 8 billion people on the planet expanding, they believe, to over 12 billion by 2050. And there are many, many nights that people cry themselves to sleep. There are, there are days that go by that you read paper where teenagers take their life. Because they say they have nobody in their circle, they have nobody in their life. Over 8 billion people on the planet, and people still have the desire to be liked, to be known, and to be involved. All three things you can find in the local church. All three things you can find in the house of God. You may have a lot of friends outside the world, but we want family inside the church. Like we want community inside the church. We have not just a answer. Come on, we've got the answer. And I love this. I love the Bible because it brings to light, hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Like I know all these things you preach about. Like what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus simply put us to love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and also love your neighbor as yourself. And so the question that we have to wrestle with today is, 
Who is the neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Is it the person that lives next door? Is it the person that I work with? Is it the waiter or waitress that serves me after the church service today? Who is my neighbor? A lot of you say, is that my ex my neighbor? Yeah. Is, is, is my ex-husband doesn't pay child support my neighbor? Yeah. Is the person I can't stand that's so offensive on social media, is that my neighbor? Yeah. Is it the people that have done me wrong? Is it the people that, that have talked bad about me? Are those my neighbors? Yeah. See, neighbors aren't just the people that are good for you. Neighbors are, are not just there that are, that, are, that are your cheerleaders in life. No, everybody you come in, come in contact with as a Christian person, they are your neighbor. And so when, when we try to manipulate the scripture like, ah, Jesus, who is, who is my neighbor? In other words, you're trying to, in your, your mind, we're trying to identify who is it that does not deserve God's grace. Like, I know I got saved, but just by simply saying, well, who is my neighbor? That means you've got somebody in your mind that you don't think deserves it. And Jesus is saying, that person. Because it's easy to love the people that love you. It's another level to love people that don't love you. Like, it's one thing for me to love and hug people that are for me, but when I got to love and hug people that are against me, like, that's a, that's a whole nother level. Because not everybody that comes to our church loves me or is for me. But guess what? They're still my neighbor. I'm still their pastor. I'm still leading them. And so the religious person says, hey, Jesus, who is, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus had this opportunity to go into any type of story that he wanted. Make no mistake about it, Jesus had this innate, this innate gift inside of him that he could take a, a sermon and he could be, draw this beautiful word picture of just anything that he wanted. And so when he was asked the question, who is my neighbor? At that moment, Jesus was given a blank canvas, able to say anything that he wanted. He could have talked about donkeys, There's all kinds of donkeys in the Bible, could have told a story about chariots. A blinged out chariot and a broke down chariot. A low riding chariot and a rejected up chariot. He could have talked about kings and kingdoms and could have talked about orchards and could have talked about farming. Jesus could have talked about anything that he wanted. He was given this blank canvas saying, hey, well, Jesus, who is my neighbor? And Jesus immediately goes into a story about a man that traveled from Jerusalem to Jericho. And while he was in transition, while he was in movement, he was attacked by robbers, beaten, and left for half dead. And what you have to understand, in Bible days, if you really want to study the text, that you'll find out that, that, that Samaritans and Jews despised one another. Like they hated one another. Like Jewish, Jewish people and Jewish priests in, in their daily prayer, they would say things that, that would be like this, Jesus, thank you that the Samaritans will not be taken up in the rapture. Like they, they despised Samaritans. They, they despised them. They hated them. And so when Jesus began to uh, write this story and, and began to, uh, you know, uh, share this story about a man being beaten and left for half dead, and when he began to unfold the story talking about a priest and a Levite and a Samaritan. See, all the religious leaders of the day thought when Jesus was telling the story, he was going to say, yeah, when the, when the pastor saw the person laying alongside the road, the pastor is going to come to the rescue. But if you read it, the priest saw the man and crossed by on the other side. Now, if, again, if you were in those days, you would understand, like, this road was called the Road of Blood. Like, it was, it was, it was well known for, it, it was a 17-mile road that went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and halfway through it was dangerous. It was, it was well known to be attacked. It was well known to be robbed. It was well known to be murdered along this stretch of road. And so, in some ways, we can understand, well, if I'm the pastor, I've got a church that I'm trying to lead. I can't put my life in jeopardy to reach this one lost person. I've got to make sure I go on to my next appointment. And the Bible says the priest saw the man. And went by on the other side. 
Luckily, Jesus goes on to say, but then a Levite came. And so a Levite, if you studied, a Levite was in charge of setting up and tearing down the temple. He was, he, was a, he was a volunteer, so to speak. He was a Sunday school teacher, so to speak. He was a youth leader, so to speak. He wasn't a priest, but he was, yet a, he was a Levite. And so Jesus said, when a Levite saw the man, surely now, Jesus, surely now the Levite's going to come save the day. But the Bible says when the Levite saw the man, he too crossed by on the other side. And this is where the story gets crazy if you're in Bible days. That Jesus says, but wait, a Samaritan came. And as a Samaritan was walking down the road, he saw the man. He saw him beat up. He saw him blooded. He saw him left half dead. And the Bible says he stopped and he went across and he began to bandage up his wounds. He began to pour oil and pour wine. And not only did, did he put him up on his donkey and take him to the inn, did he pay a little bit of a bill, but he said, I'll be back in a few days and I'll pay what's left over that, that, that this bill didn't cover. And we're going to get into what that means because a lot of people are, are looking at me like a calf at a new gate. This has nothing to do with the Good Samaritan. This has nothing to do with, 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 with the man left or half dead. It is a story of you and it is a story about me and it is a, it is a story about Jesus Christ. And so Jesus said, I, I want you to learn to love your neighbor. See, we have a church, we have a Christian culture that everybody loves about wanting to be discipled. Oh, preacher, you need to, you need to disciple more, have discipleship classes, and you need to do, do some Bible studies once in a while. I read the scriptures, Jesus never once told his disciples to take out a pen and paper. Never once said, hey guys, I'm, I'm about ready to teach you. I need you to pull out your pen, I need you to pull out your paper, get out your iPhones, get out your iPads, turn to John chapter 3. Never once did Jesus say it. But what Jesus did do is he's like, hey, guys, let's go feed 5,000. Hey, let's go to the wedding at Cana. Hey, let's, let, let, let's go to Samaria. You want, you want me to go to Samaria, Jesus? You remember that in Luke chapter, I think it's Luke chapter 8 or Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent his disciples into Samaria to get him a room to stay in. And, and the, the, the disciples, they also despised the Samaritans. And so the fact that Jesus would send him into Samaria to get Jesus a room, why would you want to stay to some place that we hate? And, and, when the, and when the disciples got there in Samaria that day, there was nobody that would give them the room. There was nobody that would give Jesus a room. There was no vacancy. There was no, no option. And so the disciples came back and said, hey, Jesus, there's nothing there. Do you want me to call down fire from heaven and scorch their lives? It's in the Bible. Like they so, they, they so hated these people that they wanted to call fire down from heaven and burn them up. And Jesus said, nah, I came to seek and save that which was lost. I, I came for all of humanity. And so we want to be discipled. You know how you be discipled? It's not by hearing, it's by doing. You want to look more like Jesus? It's not by sitting and receiving. It's by going and inviting. It's by going and loving. Like you want to change your life? You want to change your city? You want to grow our church? Like it's not found by just coming and sitting in a posture and receiving. That's not called discipleship. Like when we want to become like Jesus, we must be people that are willing to gather here and go. And when we go, we come back to gather. Are you with me? So if you want to live your life like Jesus, it's not about doing. It's about becoming. That if we want to be in the will of God... We will not be a church that settles to have a community of people just like this, but we would fight to always include. We would fight to always grow. We would fight to always expand. We would fight to make sure we live life in convenience. We will fight to have common ground. We will fight to keep our front doors open. We will fight to maintain what God's done in our church. And so Jesus is having this, this beautiful picture about who is, who is my neighbor. Could it be today? That this story is not just about a man who was beaten to death, but could it be that Jesus was, was writing a story, that Jesus was telling a story about a good Samaritan? Could it be you and I were the person that was left for half dead, traveling from the road to, on the road of life to, the, to, to Jericho? From, uh, could it be that we're going from Jericho to Jerusalem? Could it be that we were the ones that were left half dead? And the thing of being half dead means I'm still half alive. And could it be that when the world passed you by and when the church people passed you by and when your friends passed you by, Jesus said, screw it, I'll do it myself. And could it be Jesus was the good Samaritan? 
When Jesus came and he knelt down, he poured oil and wine. He didn't pour oil and wine, but he poured oil, symbolic of the power of God, and wine covered in the, with symbolic of the blood of Christ. And he not only paid the bill, but he said, hey, if this didn't cover, I'm going to go away for about three days. And when I come back, I'm going to pay the debt in full. Could it be that's talking about the resurrection of Christ, that he paid our bill the first time? But if that's not enough, when those clouds split in glory... Come on, he's going to come back and pay our debt once and for all, and forever we shall reign with God in a place called heaven. Are you with me? And so here's where I want to end on today. The greatest travesty in our world today is seeing a sick church, in an inclusive church, a sick church in a dying world. But I've come to remind us today that the, ha- the call of God on this house is to build his church, to love and to reach the lost, to love and surrender it all to God. For the first time Jesus came, he entered by a woman's womb and nobody saw him. But the next time he comes, he's going to come in glory and every eye is going to see him. The first time that he came, he came as a lamb. But the next time he comes, he's coming as the lion from the tribe of Judah. The first time he came to redeem, the next time he's coming to reign. The first time he came to die, the next time he's coming to raise the dead. The first time he wore a crown of thorns, the next next time he will wear a crown of glory the first time men ask who he is the next time men will worship him because of who he is the first time he came in poverty the next time he's coming in power the first time he came quietly the next time he's coming with all the angels of heaven one time and one time for all the first time he came in weakness but the next time he comes in majesty come on the outward the outlook on our world may be bleak but I've come to tell you that Jesus Christ is coming again and we got a city that's dying. We've got a city that's lost. We've got people that are laying half dead. And they don't need our sympathy. They need our compassion. They don't need our endorsement of their lifestyle. They need brought up out the lifestyle. They don't need the church to celebrate their sin. They need the church to bring them up out the life of sin. They don't need the church to talk down and point down. They're looking for Christian people to pull down and reach them up. You know what the posture of every Christian is? Is not this. It's this. I'm getting down on their level. If they're hurting and they're broken and they're weeping, I'm getting down in the dirt with them. I'm getting down at their lowest. I'm finding common ground. You know where common ground starts? On your knees. Too many times, churches, we have the posture that we're better and we're greater and we're holier. No, we're just saved. The difference between you and a lost person isn't how good you are. It's they've been covered by the blood of Christ. And I just wonder what our world would look like, what our families would look like, what our cities would look like if we would take on the posture of the Good Samaritan, not treating them with the ways culture would treat them, not giving them an anecdote that just trust your feelings and go with your heart and follow your feelings and love is love and it's, all, it's awesome, just trust your heart. Your heart will never steal you wrong. No, your heart will take you to hell. But what if we would treat the sickness with the blood and the oil? In other words, we don't need to create our own anecdote. It's already been given. It's the blood of Christ to cover their sin and the Spirit of God to give them power to live a faith-filled life. The only way our church grows, hear me, is by loving our neighbor the way that we love ourselves. And some of you can't love your neighbor because you haven't first loved yourself. And there's a health in that. There's a healthy love for yourself. In other words, you have to have healthy self-talk. You can't say, I'm an idiot, I'm a loser, I'm not destined for anything, God's finished with me yet. No, you, if, you, if you talk to yourself that way, then you'll view others that way. And so for, for us to truly love people the way Christ loved the church, it first starts with us looking in the mirror and being comfortable in our own skin that I love myself because Jesus created me this way. And I'm not, Jesus, Jesus loves me just the way that I am, but he also loves you too much to leave you the way that he found you. And so today, all across this room, I want you to look inwardly today. Before we look outwardly, let's look inwardly. Before we worry about the person beat up, half dead, laying on the road on your, on your way home, let's make sure that we know how to love ourselves well. Let's make sure we're getting in the word and we're getting the words that Christ has for our life in our life. And
Yeah, we want to love our neighbor. But before, before we can love our neighbor, we have to first love ourselves.